Watch this. Are you ready to see this? You see, the Word of God guides us in how to deal with issues of life. Do you understand? We don't have any other wisdom. We can't use the worldly wisdom to deal with things. We can only use the Word of God. See, God's what instructs us, guides us, and shows us how to deal with things. See, the Bible says Jesus knew all men and didn't need anybody to testify man to him, for he knew what was in man. In other words, the Word of God knows man. The Bible says all things are unveiled to him with whom we have to do. That's the Word of God. All right? The Word of God has eyes. He knows people more than we could ever know them. So if you ever want to understand an individual, want to understand anybody, look at the Word of God. You'll find everyone in this book. Come on. I'm reading verse 10. Then came the word of the Lord. That's verse 10, chapter 15, 1 Samuel. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me. And had not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. You know, the Lord told Samuel this, and, and it grieved Samuel, because the Lord told him this, and he cried all night long. Now look at this, verse 12. And, and when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Camel, and behold, he set him up a place, and he's gone about, and passed on, and gone down to Gilgal. And, and Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. That's Saul talking. Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have already talking. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. I've sent him my report. And Samuel said, What minute then the, this bleating of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Because while he was, while he was saying, I have performed the commandment of the Lord, Samuel, Samuel heard, Meh! And he said, so, 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 so what's the meaning of that? <laughs> Verse 15, And Saul said, <laughs> You see, let, let me tell you something. Now, I want you to understand this. I understand something here. This is very, very vital. Hmm. You see, Saul hardly saw his errors. I want you to understand somebody like this. He cannot blame himself. They didn't, they didn't instruct, they didn't tell us early. They always, the reason for my not doing what I was supposed to do has to be somebody else. Look at the man. Samuel says, so what, what, what minute this bleeding that I hear and this lowing of the oxen that I hear? And he says, they, verse 15, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. They, he didn't say we. They have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Did you hear that? They brought them, they brought them to sacrifice to the Lord. They, they brought them. Then Samuel said unto Saul, stay, and I will tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said, go on, speak on. And Samuel said, when thou was little in thine own sight. That's what I'm thinking about some of you here now. You're playing with your office. You're playing with the instruction given to you. You're playing with the assignment given to you. But when you were first made that PCF leader, or PCU leader, or deacon, or something, it was so big to you, you honored it, you revered it. It was important to you because you were little in your eyes. You have become too big. You have become too big. Now you can be corrected. Now you can be instructed. You have become too big. Too big. You can now decide whether or not to do it. By the time I finish, you will know whether this is of men or of God. Now, same, same book, same chapter. I'm reading his, his words. Verse 17. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thy own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. 
wherefore then this thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but this fly upon the spoil, and this evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, oh boy, this is so painful, so painful, look at it. Saul replied, Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed. It's painful. When a man no longer can see his errors, he has become so blind he can't see. I remember Samson, when Samson, when Samson was taken away by the Philistines and taken to the prison house, the first thing they did was to remove his eyes. When you are no longer acting with God, when you are no longer, when the Spirit of God departs from you, the first thing that the enemy does is to remove your eyes and you cannot see anymore. He lost his sight. He lost his sight. Every time you're in the wrong place, you lose your sight. Now here is the man Saul and he has lost his sight. He can't understand that he's done something wrong. He can't see it. Ah, but I came. Ah, but I did it. But I did. He can't see his error. He said, but I have obeyed. And it's obvious to anybody that he didn't. The instruction was clear. He flattered it. And now he says, but I have obeyed. He can't see it. See, I pray to God. And I pray to God often. I don't want to become a professional. I want to be a Christian. Not a professional. I don't ever want to become a professional preacher. Because it's easy to become professional. It's easy. You will know the Christian behavior. You will know all of those things. You will know the Christian prayer. And the Christian worship. And the Christian leadership. You know all of these things. But what you're doing may be empty. You may see results, you may win souls. But don't deceive yourself. If the word of God cannot dominate your spirit, if the word of God cannot bring that humility into your spirit, you have lost your sight. In the book of Revelation, he said, I know you. He said, I know that you have a name that thou livest, but you are dead. That's what he said. He said, I know you have a name that you are alive. I know you believe everything is all right. I know you think everything is fine. He said, but what you have is dead. Why? Because you are not acting according to... See, the Christian spirit, there's something about the word of God. You should be more than a miracle worker. You should be more than a preacher. It should produce humility in you. And humility has nothing to do with tears. Your faithfulness. It should produce in you a faithful spirit. That's what it should do. It should br br bring into you the fear of God. What kind of fear? We're talking about godly reverence. Godly reverence. That makes you to say the right words. There are words that cannot come out, come out of your mouth. They just can't come out of your mouth. Insulted words can't come out of your mouth. And you become so humble. It doesn't matter who is chairing that meeting. You'll be there. Because you see the spirit of the Lord in that place. But when you have become too big. You say me. You have become you. Those in charge have become too small. But the day will come that God will exalt them above you. And because it will be by the hand of God. You can't do anything about it. I know how that some of us were despised. Today, this ministry cannot be called a mushroom church. Because that person will be having the wrong definition. But there was a day, there was a day that they did not want to look at us. There was a day. And all I could say then was, Lord, it's up to you to let them know that you sent us. There was a day another minister took our magazine and tore it. I know the kind of things that I've, I've heard from people coming to talk to me. Words that they should have never spoken to me. But I looked. Give yourself an occasion. There was a guy, a minister, who went around giving some real bad stories about me. And he sent people to come and meet me and talk to me. That I was, uh, that I, I was sending people out to beg for money for the ministry, and I've never done that. 
They said, this fellow come talk to me. And the guy came and said, you want to see me? I said, all right, you're welcome. He sat down and he started preaching to me and advising me for what I never did. I listened to him. I even, even in that situation, I wouldn't allow a proud spirit. I let him speak. When he was through, I said, thank you. And he left. I said, oh God, you know that I have been fully misunderstood. It's unfair, but I leave it to you. It's only a few years since then now, the one who was talking to me, his Christian life went upside down and he moved away. He became a subject of prayer and intercession. The minister who went to talk to him went out of the church and went into drinking and smoking. But I'm still here. The person they said I sent someone to ask for money was sent to prison. But I'm still here. Are you still in this place? There was a day that people who used to be with us came to church and the place was so small. You put all of us on this platform. They looked here and they walked away. Only God knows where they would have been now. But they looked at us as insignificant and were ashamed of us. They were ashamed to be associated with us. They turned around and walked away. I only ask God to look upon it. But it's only a few years between then and now. Only a few years between then and now. Be humble in your life. Humility is not man's description of you. It's God's description of you. Did you hear me? It's God's description of you. Learn to be humble. Learn to be humble. Judas Iscariot accused Jesus of allowing a very costly ointment to be spent on him. For the next few verses, Judas sells Jesus for money. Isn't that right? <laughs> I'm touched by God's response. Look at this. Let's go on reading. We're not through yet. We're not through yet. <clears throat> verse, verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, he still says it's the people, he doesn't think he's the one, but the people took of the spoils, sheep and oxen, the chief things, which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Oh boy, look at this. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Watch this. You see, your attitude is very very important when you are corrected what is your attitude what is your attitude your attitude when you when you when you're corrected do you feel how can they say that to me in the presence of all those people in the presence of all those people that's the thing that's spending me oh what a shame oh what a shame what a shame a man who has become a prisoner of the thoughts of others a prisoner of the opinions of others what a shame have you become a prisoner don't ever let yourself become a prisoner of the opinions of others that when you are reprimanded or corrected just because others are there you have the wrong attitude you reject the correction i will show you this man's attitude and then i will read someone else to you but i want you to see it are you still here a woman was with the daughter and they went out there were several people there the girl did something that was wrong 
and the, the mother hit her. Oh, she was so bitter. She was so bitter. Later, she was asked, what, what was the thing that offended you so much? She said, I don't mind my mother beating me at home. It's what she did to me outside that hurt me because people were there. What a shame. What a shame. She did not know the way of honor. That your mother could beat you in the presence of others is your glory. See, human beings don't know. They don't understand the glory of God. They don't understand the wisdom of God. That your mother cannot talk to you outside is a shame. That she cannot reprimand you outside is a shame. It is said that it's only a child that is respectful that you beat. You know what that implies. The one that is not respectful will not only reject your correction, he will fight you. And he will do that to his own hurt, to his own destruction. But look at this man. Look at this man. Look at this man. This man saw. Verse 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned. Watch this. Watch it. I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Yes! You know what Jesus said in St. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 44? He said, those who are concerned about the honor of men cannot believe in God. In other words, they will not, they cannot obey. See, to believe is to act upon. They cannot act upon the word of God. Because they seek the honor of men. If you seek men's honor, you will not fully obey the words of God. If he instructs you, you will not fully obey. Because you're concerned about what others think about you. Because you're constantly fighting to present yourself an image that you have thought of. What you want them to think about you. But you have refused and failed to receive the honor that comes from God only. Brothers and sisters, it's only the honor that comes from God that is worth it. That's all that's needed. Hallelujah. That's all that's needed. It says, because I fear the people and obey their voice. Now therefore, watch it. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected thee from being king of Israel. And, Sa and as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and has given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned. Yet honor me, I pray thee, before the elders of my people. See, because the elders were watching. The elders were there. And he had wanted to present himself to be somebody. You know, when, when, when Samuel came, he hadn't even asked Saul anything when Saul spoke up. I have just arrived. I have obeyed the, the word of the Lord. And his elders were with him. Now he's rejected and he's concerned about the people around. He says, please, Samuel, please honor me before my elders. Please. He's concerned. And you know what? The Bible tells us that Samuel, Samuel was a smart man. He quickly turned around and joined him. You know why? The next chapter will tell you why. He knew that Saul had now become a wicked man. Because if the Lord turns away from a man, he cannot have the right spirit anymore. And he said to himself, if I don't do this, this man will kill me. Look at it in the next chapter. You'll find that when the Lord asked him to go and anoint a man in the house of Jesse, and um, he, said, <laughs> he said to the Lord, if Saul gets to know that I'm in town, he'll kill me. That's what Samuel said. Why would he have thought that way? Because he knew the Spirit of God had departed from Saul. Are you still in this place? Yes. Who was this Saul? He hoped that his good deeds would substitute for obedience. Yes. He hardly saw his own error. Instead, he argued with Samuel, insisting that he had obeyed. 
when he eventually accepted that something was wrong what did he do he blamed others for it he never blamed himself he blamed others for it he would rather have others dealt with he's surprised that the whole thing is coming on him when they were the cause let's look at another man by the name of David do you want to see him okay David sinned against God on two major occasions in the first one when he numbered Israel turn to second Samuel chapter 24 second Samuel chapter 24 why do I share these things with you for you to have wisdom the wisdom of God for you to be guided in your ways for you to learn how to take your steps these are the see, the many of you here you, you 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 became Christians after you were much grown up you have never really read and studied from the Old Testament you don't know what is there some of you have never really studied these things stories things that have to do with men and their characters cities towns and countries you never really studied these things but these things are very vital because as you study them you find God's dealings with nations God's dealings with cities God's dealings with men you understand different kinds of characters and God's ways God's attitudes towards their behavior you understand how does God see this how does God see this how does God see this what are the implications of my actions it's good to know yeah I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus yes but does God care about the, my state of mind does he care about what's in my heart or can my heart just think anything is it okay when you're talking about Christian growth this is what it's all about first it brings you out you know he brings you out of the mess but he doesn't want you to take the mess with you if somebody fell into the gutter talk to me now there's a very muddy day all right a very rainy day and the guy he falls into the gutter and it, there's, there's a lot of mud in there so somebody rescues him brings him out of the mud and then he comes in that condition will you put him in that condition on your bed no you're gonna say we we've got you out of the mess it's time to get the mess out of you see because we brought you out of the mess but the mess is still on you we got to get the mess out of you you understand now after you're born again see you're like the man who's been brought out of the mess but you see your mind still has a lot of things it used to know when you were in the world you still have those thoughts those desires may not be there but you still have the imaginations you still have the kind of things the, the, the drinking you don't drink anymore but you still see the bottles your old friends are still there the old temptations are still there back in those days there were not temptations anymore there were not temptations at all you just you just flowed with them but now they're still there the things that used to offend you are still there but now they're going to be temptations they'll tempt you to want to drink them again they'll tempt you to want to watch those films again they'll tempt you to get angry that way again they'll tempt you to do those things again and a bona fide temptation can only come in things that you really want But through the Word of God, through the study of the Word of God, and these things begin to get out of you. They begin to leave you. They leave you. But if you're not in the Word, if you're not being taught and brought up in the Word of God, these things will remain there. They'll be there and you'll never know it. Somebody says the choices of life, not the compulsions, reveal character. Now what does that mean? When you're free to choose, that's what we're really going to know what kind of a mind you have. Just because you see a lady with low cut doesn't mean she likes it. She may just be acting that way because her father says you're not going to make that hair longer than that, all right? Short cut only. And so every time you see her in a short cut, you think, oh boy, I really like her short hair. But the day she gets out of home, like some of you young girls, you know what I'm talking about. You're in that school and they don't let you, they don't let you make your hair. You just comb it. Soon as you're through class five or your SS, is that SS three? Soon as they're through, you can't believe the hair change in 24 hours. 
that shows us what they really liked but they were under obedience under instruction under authority so they couldn't do it they said well you girls you would love to wear trousers the only reason you don't wear someone says oh i love that girl she never wears trousers she just wears skirts only maybe she hasn't got in the money to buy it yet you'd be amazed when she starts buying them she doesn't use red lipstick she doesn't oh i, I mean i just love her she doesn't have makeup you don't know why wait till she gets a better job You know what I'm talking about. See, I'm trying to say, I'm trying to say that there are certain things that are inside us and they don't show up until they are prompted. They don't show up uh, until the situation allows for them. So I, I'm, I'm actually looking at the other side. There are certain things that are wrong and they may be inside us in our mentality. And we have allowed them to stay. We haven't eliminated them with the Word of God just because we haven't studied the Word. The Word of God will throw light into your life. He'll show you the dark spots. He'll show you the hidden things that shouldn't be there. And as the word of God is brought to you as a light, you begin to see these things in you. And then you can get rid of the mess. But if you don't use the word, you will never know they are there until you're faced with the situation. You'll be amazed at the way you'll act. That's the reason some people can the, the, the ladies today they got married to unbelievers and they can't tell why they can't believe it i couldn't believe i'll ever fall in love with my unbeliever boss i can't understand it i drank with him i had sex with him i can't understand it but i'm a P pcu leader i can't believe it i can't believe it. i never thought it'll ever happen yeah because you never use the word of god to check and circumcise yourself if you had used the words you have opened all those hidden things to you and corrected you and guided you the word of god prepares you for things you haven't seen as yet by the time you face them you are already gone for them but you lay the word aside and you'll never know so i show you these things to get the wisdom of god into you so you know how to deal with thoughts that come to you how to deal with circumstances the things that tempt you i'm just in that guy you know he said he's sitting down he said oh i'm so tired no more he says oh, i'm so tired the more tired he is he says, oh, i'm so tired i'm really i just can't do anything i can go anywhere oh boy i, I can't i can't go out today i feel so tired i had a long day i had a very very hard day i can't go i can't go for the service no 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 not me i'm too tired mm -mm -mm, next week then yeah, there's fire in the kitchen Achha! Where did he get the strength from? I thought he was too tired to get up. Now there's fire and he's... <laughs> he had it in him all the time. He had, he had it in him all the time. He talked himself out of it. Convinced himself he couldn't do it. You know what? Don't do what your mind tells you to do. Do what you ought to do. That's the way to check your life. What you ought to do. What is right. This is the right thing to do, so do it. Because it is the right thing to do. Not because you feel so, not because you think so, but because you know this is the right thing to do. You may not want it, but does the word say so? If the word of God tells you this is the way, then that's the way, go ahead and do it. That's the way to train your spirits, to get your mind to succumb to your spirits. Don't let your mind dominate your spirit. Hallelujah. Are you still here? So Saul desired the approval of men. And looking at David, you know, Saul, Saul's passion for human honor was so strong that his repentance was not genuine. His passion for human acceptance, his passion for human honor was too strong. So strong. His attitude was wrong. He defended himself. It's not me. They, they, they made me do it. In other words, they did it. They did it, he said. They did it. When he found out he was involved, he said, well, they made me do it. Look at David. Second Samuel chapter 24. I'm reading verse 10. See this man's attitude, this dear man of God. David had, he had numbered Israel and he knew it was wrong to do so. But look at this, verse 10. And David's heart smote him. 
after that he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have seen greatly in what I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servants, for I have done very foolishly. Did you see that? He said, I have done what? Very foolishly. He didn't say they. He says, I have done very foolishly. Most touching. God took actions against him in spite of the fact he said he had done very foolishly. God gave him three options. He said, choose one. I do this to you or this or this or this. And I'm, I'm going to deal with you. Well, God took actions against him. But look at this. And, and one of those options made that several people in the land were going to be punished for what he did. Watch the man's attitude. Turn to verse 17. Verse 17. And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. Can you see the attitude of this man? He's, he sees the people dying because of his own actions. So he says, Oh God, I, I was the one who did wickedly. I was the one who sinned. But these ones, what have they done? What have they done? I should be the one to be punished. He took responsibility for it. Saul wouldn't take responsibility. He has a different spirit. Then what about his attitude towards people? He didn't feel that it was the people. Psalm 51. This had to do with his second scene. In Psalm 51, you find his attitude here in verses 3 and 4. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Did you see that? I sinned against you. He doesn't think he owes anybody anything. He's not thinking about people now. He thinks about, it's God, I, I, I've sinned against God. You see, when your focus is right, your life turns out right. The man's focus was right. His focus was right. Even when his son, his son declared war against him and he was running away, there was a man who was cursing David with curses. And... Um, his captain said, let me go and strike that man who's accusing you and cursing the king. He said, no, leave him. He said, maybe the Lord will hear him and then forgive me. He said that before the captain. He wasn't ashamed to acknowledge that he did something wrong. What, what do you learn? Who do you learn from? The Bible says, do not learn from a violent man. He says, don't go with a violent man lest you learn his ways. If you have someone that's close to you and, and is hot tempered, everything, anything makes him mad, don't get close to him. The Bible says, lest you learn his ways. He doesn't want you to learn his ways. We are influenced by the people we run with. And don't you be proud of a wrong attitude. Don't be, don't be proud with something wrong in your character. Something that ought to be taken away. The Bible talks about those people. He said they are proud of what they should, they should be ashamed of. That God is their appetite. All they think about is this life here on earth. We read that in Philippians, the third chapter, reading from the 17th verse. So they are proud of what they should be ashamed of. Living Bible. Just write TLB. It says, whose glory, King James says, Who, whose glory is in their shame? You shouldn't be proud. You know, I, 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 have, I, have, I, have, I have a hot temper. What do you mean you have a hot temper? Get it away. What do you need with it? Praise the Lord. Are you still in this place? Yes. Lastly, we look at a lady. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. She's found there in the 38th chapter, 38th verse. St. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 10. Oh, I find this woman interesting. I read quick. Are you ready? 
Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into, Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was combat. Did you see that? Martha was combat. In other words, distracted. That's the word. Martha was distracted. She was combat about much serving. And, and came to him. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, does thou not care that my sister had left me to serve alone? Be thou therefore that she help me. And she answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art worried. King James is careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. He said, Martha, Martha. You are troubled, you are worried about many things. But one thing is needful. There's something you require. You're worried about many things, distracted. You're distracted. But one thing is necessary. You see, you may not understand this whole part until you know the person of matter. I think I should explain this matter to you. You get to know her in St. John's Gospel, chapter 11. Now, Martha is a very forward person. She, 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 are you still in this place? Now, notice it was a house Jesus came. Now, Jesus didn't come to visit Mary. Notice that. Jesus came to visit Martha. The Bible tells us about Martha and tells us the minor. She had a sister called Mary. Jesus came to Martha. Martha received Jesus into her house. So she's the one who introduces the rest of the family to Jesus. So she's the main person that Jesus knows in this home. So Jesus comes to Martha. Martha receives Jesus in. She has a sister called Mary. She has a brother called Lazarus. But who received Jesus in? Martha was. She did. All right. Now, you're going to see her character. She's quite forward. Her brother Lazarus gets sick. Now, notice this. Jesus comes into the home in St. Luke's Gospel. And what does she do? Quick, make food. Get something for Jesus. She doesn't even know what Jesus wants. But make food. Get this for Jesus. She's getting everything that is unnecessary to the master. This is the man who fed 5,000 men. Women and children were not counted. What food will you give him? Instead of listening to his word, she's going about all the unimportant things. When Jesus, you want to cook for him? Let me tell you about him. After his resurrection, his disciples had gone back to fishing. And uh, Jesus came, they, they saw him on the shore, they didn't know it was Jesus. And uh, Jesus said, children, do you have any meat? They had toiled all night, couldn't catch nothing. And Jesus said, all right, cast your net on the right side of the boat, you shall have. And they did, and they enclosed a the multitude of fishes. Then uh, they had a problem bringing it to land. And Jesus said, well, take out of the fishes that you have and come over this way. By the time they came, they found Jesus had fried fish. Listen, the Bible didn't say he was, he was making it there. Where did the fire come from? Read it for yourself in the last chapter in John's Gospel. He brought all those things alive into that place. Then he said, add from the ones you have. You know why? Because he wanted them to have the opportunity to compare the two of them together. The miracle fish and the river fish. That's why he said, bring from the ones you have. He joined it, not because he couldn't have made enough. He wants them to test this one and taste that one. When he turned dishwater, dishwater, you remember dishwater? The water they were they, they have to wash all this. Dishwater. All the things they used in washing themselves, they put them inside that thing and washed them with that water. The Bible says they put it by the door. Jesus turned that water into wine. Now he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. He said, "Now fill them up. 
filled them up. There was some water because people had been using them, so it was shorter. So he said, fill them up. And he added more to the dishwater. Jesus said, take out of that one now. Take it to the chairman of the occasion. And when the man did it, he, he, he took it. He didn't know where the water came from. The Bible says it was the servants who knew where the water came from. And they were watching. And the chairman, whoo, he said, I've never had a drink so good in my life. And the servants were amazed because they knew, the Bible says, they knew where the water came from. So the one who got wine, who turned water into wine, dish water, and was frying fish, and nobody knew where the fire came from or where the containers came from. And I guarantee you, Jesus wouldn't be carrying a frying pan like this in town. Now would he have gone to buy fish from anybody? This woman wants to cook for him. <laughs> All right. I just want you to know who Martha really is. We find Martha in St. John's Gospel, the 11th chapter. Now she sends a message to Jesus. Him whom thou lovest is sick. Lazarus is sick. Please hurry up and come and heal him. Because he was a miracle worker and had come to the house several times. So they expected Jesus to naturally be so moved and quickly come. But Jesus delayed. He didn't go. <laughs> now you're going to know matter. Four days later, that was four days after the man had died, Jesus came. The Bible tells us someone came to Martha and Mary. They were both in the house and they said, Jesus is here. Mary was still crying. She was there in the house. Martha ran straight to Jesus. You would think she was going to welcome him. No, she was mad. Here's a lady who was forward. She felt she was popular with the master. She knew the master. Why didn't he come? It had been a problem to her. Why didn't Jesus come for my brother? He had healed everybody. He had been to her house. I had given him food. Now he wouldn't even come to heal my brother. When you start thinking that you qualify for the master's blessings by reason of your own things, your good things that you've done for him, you're in the wrong place. Soon as she saw Jesus, she said, oh, she accused him of lateness and a lack of care. Read it for yourself. If you had been here four days ago, my brother would not have died. She hasn't even said my brother is dead. She accuses him. If you had been here four days ago, you think it was a statement of faith. No. She was too forward. I'll give you more. If you had been here four days ago, my brother would not have died. She puts the responsibility on Jesus. Jesus says, your brother shall live again. Yeah, I know he'll live on the last day in the resurrection. See, she's preaching it. She, she's, she, in other words, don't hand me that stuff. I already know that. Everybody's going to come out in the last day. Anyway, Jesus, where have you laid him? They go there. On getting to that place, there's a crowd. Martha is there. Mary is there. Many Jews are there. A, a lot of the leaders of the Jews are there. And Jesus says, roll the stone away. Guess who tries to stop Jesus? Martha. Now she accuses him of trying to desecrate the dead. No! By now, he stinks. It's been there four days. Martha can't be still. Her blood is very hot. Are you like Martha? Her blood is too hot. She has to be in control. See, she, she can't be okay. She has to be in control. She has to manipulate. She has to put everybody in his place. She has to organize Jesus. What's he doing? What's he doing? Is he, what's he doing? Is he, what's he doing? What's he doing? Please stop. Jesus says, didn't I tell you? If you would only believe, you'd see the glory of God. Now roll the stone away. 
I love Jesus. I love Jesus. He didn't let matter intimidate him. You cost it. If you had been here four days, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. I know you will rise in the last day, but it's going to come out. I know that. Well, Jesus says, <laughs> you are looking at the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. She didn't know Jesus. She had fed this man, but didn't know him. To her, he was a miracle worker, a good minister, a nice preacher. I like him. He's a good man. That was all. Had she known that Jesus was God, it would have been different. The moment Jesus showed up, she would go down. Welcome. Anytime you come is the right time, sir. She would have known. Because he says, I am God. Is there anything too hard for me? She hadn't known him. She hadn't known him. People who are too forward, they are that way. They always think they know too much. Are you like that? Be careful. We have satellite church pastors here. Some of you are from satellite churches. What do you think of the pastor? I know. Maybe when you see him, you buy him a bottle of Coke and he drinks it. So say, I drink Coke, he drinks Coke. Is it because the pastor laid hands on him the other day? That's when we were together in the class. I did the training program, he did the training program. Is it because they anointed him pastor before me? I'm a coordinator, but he's a pastor, but we're the same. Be careful. Don't be too forward. Be careful. What you're seeing see you may never be able to appreciate something that you cannot perceive it takes the spirit of God to open your eyes to see it takes the spirit of God to open your eyes to see I pray that he would open your eyes I pray that he would guide you and instruct you that one thing that is needed in your life I pray that he will help you to get it amen that it will come into your life through the word of God. That you discover, if you have been unfaithful, that you will become faithful. That you become trustworthy. Become trustworthy. They said, to, they said to John the Baptist, We saw that man you talked about when you were baptizing. He now is baptizing many people. What are you going to do about it? What did Jesus say? What did John say? He says, He that owns the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom rejoices to hear the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. His glory has to swallow me up. He wasn't fighting for his own glory. Jesus said, the one that you should not trust is the man that seeketh his own glory. That's what Jesus said. He said, the one who seeks his own glory, he said, don't trust him. Don't trust you. Don't trust you. I counsel you to become trustworthy. To become faithful. Become faithful. Check your life. Who are you? You must make adjustments. That's growth. Adjustments. Become better in your life. Become better in your life. I pray that God will guide you. 